It is just on the computer. It is 401. I'm all leading the way to select board to order. First order of business to review the minutes of the meeting of July 25th. Any comments? I have one very minor punctuation comment. Uh, second sentence. Also present was select board member Julie Wagner. I would put a comment after that. So I mean, comma after that, so it doesn't look like both Joyce and I were uh, attending the Zoom. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? No other comments from me. Joyce. None. Um, I will move to accept the minutes. Second. All in favor? Yes. Yes. Vendor and payroll warrants. No in comments. the packet, no comments. We move along. Do we have any members of the public for comment? Seeing none, seeing none online. No scheduled appointments. Nothing new on the COVID front aside from available tasks. All business. Discuss changes in the budget planning process. Brian, you want to go into? Yeah, I just wanted to um, start a discussion, I guess, in terms of. I don't. I don't really want to think about uh, fiscal year twenty five, but before we know it, it's. I mean, it's it's August already, right? Um, and if we want to start the process earlier. Possibly some system is October. I was thinking maybe in terms of capital planning. I just think it's worthwhile about having discussions about um you know what what we think can be improved upon um in terms of timing or in terms of the process. Mm -hmm. Um the issues that came up this previous fiscal year during the budgeting process related to really to personnel issues, um, in particular how um, recommendations in terms of compensation were arrived at um, and also in terms of, of how the the, uh, the COLA was arrived at. Um, now, I, I, I feel like I don't have a lot of great suggestions as to as to how to remedy those, but I, I felt like there was a lot of tension this past budget season on those two issues. Um, I'd like, yeah. I'm just going to uh, hop back to the capital plan for a second. And I think Fred, you're still the liaison on the capital, yeah. capital plan. planning committee. That doesn't necessarily, that, that's not necessarily time dependent. That, I mean, we could start that in October and then give ourselves a little bit more time. It's not that we're waiting on anything, you know? Yes and no, because we have to. We get the recommendations from the department heads. Those would happen. Those would have to happen earlier. Those have, and yeah, we'd get delays and pushback there because they, some of the department heads don't won't know what they want. Right. That early. I wonder if starting a little bit earlier, it, for some things, it felt like we were chasing information, and maybe the the if, if we can give people greater time to chase the information, maybe we'll get a better outcome. I was also thinking that there's a little bit of a mismatch between. Um, uh, or a disconnect between the, the community the CPA application deadline, which is in December, and the capital planning process. Sometimes we, re we review projects that we might think are CPA eligible, but it's past the second Tuesday of the, you know, the Tuesday of the second Wednesday in December, and, and that deadline has passed. So we're suggesting to the applicants, well, we're not going to fund it this year, but you should apply for CPA next year. A la the batting cages at Hurley Park, and then 12 months later, people forget that they should submit it, and then it's so. I think if we could have the process start a little bit earlier, and we can get back to those uh, the the project proponents before the CPA deadline, we could line things up a little bit better. Would it be possible to do a two tiered system, one for projects that might be CPA eligible, and just Letting departments know, okay, these, these are the areas that might be CPA eligible, open space, housing, start preservation. If you have anything for those, we need those more quickly as opposed to equipment or something which would not be CPA. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we can try to 
Oh, push earlier for CPA. The things that might be CPA eligible is recreation is where a lot of that would end up coming in. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would not be as much fire department, police department. Right. It, it's recreation yeah. and yeah. conservation commission or mostly within, you know, within the town offices here. But, but, but I think we can move earlier for things and you know, let the department heads know if there's anything that even conceivably CPA eligible, we need that in early. Yeah. It, it, yeah. In, in the past, this, the solicitation for the projects yeah. has gone out in the middle of December, which is past the deadline. So right. If we can get that ahead, that I think that we can get, get that solicitation out, at least for that first wave CPA project, say in October. Yeah. And, yeah. But then still giving the department's time for other equipment that might need replacing as, as the year goes on. Yeah. And the other project that, that I'm thinking about that sort of got time. The timing was too short for what the CIPC was asking for, and I think rightfully asking for was the air conditioning at the school. Um, it was, yeah. you know, to put in mini splits in this room, this room, this room, this room, because mini splits don't, because we don't have mini splits in this room. Not really answering the question, are, are mini splits the right solution for the entire building right. based upon the age of your boilers and all in the energy management system you have, and there's just a disconnect there. I think with more time, they, they might have been able to figure it out. Well, so it, it, I can speak on the path of capital committee. It just seemed like a piecemeal approach to the problem. And right. we're looking for an overall recommendation for heating and cooling the building, not, right. not band-aids you know, band for specific rooms. Right. So I think the sooner that if we can start that process a yeah. little bit earlier, it'll it'll allow some of that. It'll, it'll hopefully, but then, then it involves getting feedback from the school, which in the budget process has always been one of the last things to come in is school, right. school feedback. Yeah. yeah. Um, in, in terms of in terms of the the personnel <laughs> decisions, um, in terms of the personnel committee, um, I sort of broke this down into to two. Um, the one with salary, salary and wage adjustments. Um, I, I mean, the the timing of it, if we're comparing FY24 salaries of other communities, we know those. Um, we should, that every town should know those after town meetings, after town meeting has um, passed and the, their budgets have been approved. They should know what their pay rates are for FY24. So really, if, if we're going to continue with that comparison, it could happen at any time after that. Historically, it's been a little bit crunched. You know, it's been closer to December or January when we're trying to chase the information. Um, and I'm not even sure if that's the process that we want to continue using or not. Um, the, the other, the other, the other uh, process that some communities use is a, a, a classification and compensation plan which is sort of a, a different way of trying to figure out the salaries in, in compensation based on the, the responsibilities of the position and an approved plan um, and weight in different wages for those different classifications and categories, which the town doesn't currently have. Um, well, if I understand correctly, we used to have it. At some point, I was told that the town needs to have it. Yeah. Um, if, for instance, Deerfield has one. Mm -hmm. um, I, there, there's uh, there's pluses and minuses to each approach. Uh, neither approach is perfect. Um, so I, I think either way, there's going to be there can be criticism either way. Um, and, Are you comfortable laying out at the moment pluses and minuses for the um, tiered compensation? Um, like like Deerfield has. Just for us to think about. Yeah. Um, I can just a little bit of my opinion on it. I think um, if I'm comparing one to the other, I think a, a classification and compensation plan, uh, the town, it, let me compare it to how we do with this, how we do it with, with the current system it, it, is we not, every year, not every position is bumped up with our, with the current 
way in which we compare salaries, whether the classification compensation plan typically um if whatever the certain criteria are if they're met then the then there's a pay bump right there's a pay increase okay. um as that goes along and that can become expensive over time for a community um so and, and then so those are sort of built-in increases that happen and it, it's sort of not dependent on um, what else is going on in the community in terms does of, it have to include a bump every year or can it um i don't i believe you could set it up however however we would want to do it, however you would want to do it um so i think it can get it can get expensive mm -hmm. um whereas the way we do it now i think the town saves more money that way because there's not really a there's not really a built-in increase each year mm -hmm. um, it sounds like the way we do it now leaves a little more discretion in our hands as far as increases rather than mandated increases. Yeah, the personnel committee looks at it each year based on, on those comparable communities. Um, but it's so so now we're it, it seems to me that the compensation plan we're, we're we're setting up a plan and that's what we're going with. Whereas we're doing it now year by year. Um, each year we're trying to look at it as to how our compensation relates to other communities, other comparable communities, and we do on a yearly basis. Mm -hmm. um, with that compensation plan, we would set the plan and then go by that plan. Mm -hmm. um, so, is there a possibility yeah. of mixing the two? Um, it seems like an awful lot of moving parts and an awful lot of work for the personnel committee. I'm just making yeah. stuff up right here. Not making stuff up, but yeah. just conjecturing. Mm -hmm. um, an awful lot of moving parts and an awful lot of work for the personnel committee each year to grab and compare rates from surrounding towns and it's also kind of like you know what are they doing what are they doing whereas if we had something that was steadier but we had also possibly built in that it wasn't a bump every single year uh, but that there were tiers of classifications that were like every five years or every three years and then we also did a brief comparison to other communities and or um, COLA. Um, yeah. It might give our employees a little bit more security in terms of what their salaries look like from year to year. And it also might prevent a little bit of headbutting between the finance committee and personnel committee. Yeah. Maybe we should set up some sort of working group to, or committee to make a recommendation on this. I, I think <laughs> we need some. We need some. Our, our discussing it here is to <laughs> yeah. solve the problem. We, we have some well, we're just reason. brainstorming. Right. Well, yeah. Yeah. It, it, I mean, I don't want. I started this by saying it's already it's, it's only August, but it's already August. And yeah. um, you know, I feel like in less than four months, we're, we're, this is going to be something that we're really thinking about. And, and I would much rather figure out how we how we want to do it now, and then wait till you know. There's also an issue doing at this particular time is that this past year, this past spring, we had a large number of vacancies that we had to fill and provide mm -hmm. salaries for far more than a typical year yeah so this really came to a head then and i think on an ongoing basis it won't be as severe a crunch as we hit this year with all the vacancies and movement mm -hmm. that we had yeah half a dozen or more positions that were all being filled in the spring. Well, I, I don't know that there's the urgency now that they would have, would have been happy considered a year ago. Yeah, it's always been in the, uh, it's always, at least as long as I've been here, it's always been an underlying yeah. Yeah. Some contention. Yeah. Um, some the some years are more pronounced than others. Yeah. I'm a big fan of consistency, uh, 
and to some degree predictability. And I want our employees, the employees of the town, to feel appreciated. I don't necessarily think it's beneficial to them to have us bantering on a yearly basis over the worth of their work. Um, and at the same time, I also understand the concerns of the finance committee about what kind of money we have to pay salaries. So I'm just, I'd be interested in something that can streamline the process and add maybe a little bit of predictability and take away some of the stress that's inherent in the process that we currently have. I, I'd like to see some input and let the finance committee discuss it, get some input from them. Because it seems that even from their point of view, they're going to be conflicting interests that they would should resolve whether they would prefer what's more important to them, the consistency or the the dollars that might get great be greater with a more structured system. Uh, and I think life will be easier for everyone if they gave them at least their thoughts on that. We can follow a recommendation. Yeah. Um, rather than something being imposed on the finance committee that they might or might not like. At the end of last year's discussion, I like, said to the head of the finance committee, there looks like we have a lot of discussions. Going on in our in our future, so I yeah. I advocate for more discussion and communication. Uh, I don't know if that would be a joint discussion with us in the finance committee or the finance committee that would preliminary discussion on their own. And it, they, I I mean. Make some suggestions. It, it met in time since then, and there's not really been a substantive discussion on this topic. Um, Maybe there should be. Well, I think there should be. Yeah, the question is, the question is, uh, in, in, I think it's best if uh, they're presented with information, choice, uh, choices, right? Like what, what are the, what are the realistic possibilities that we could adopt here? Yeah. Because, um, because it, it, in some ways, it feels like we spin our wheels um, when we don't have sort of concrete, like uh, if, when there's nothing to comment on, essentially. Right. Because um, mm -hmm. I think at the end of the day, I mean, they feel like uh, I'll generalize for a second that, that they're looking out for, you know, they're focusing on the dollars. Yep. Right. Um, right. Tax. Increase or yeah. Uh, so, on the other hand, we also get complaints about how compensation has arrived at now, which might save dollars. So, yeah, it's a question. Of, <laughs> to, yeah. to some extent, which they prefer. So, what if <clears throat> what if I reach out to the to the chair of the finance committee and try to let them know that we want to discuss how to treat yeah. compensation. Yeah. Um, and let's discuss it in August and September instead of December, January, February, March. March. <laughs> February, March. <laughs> <laughs> um, comes up. Yeah. And trying to come to some understanding, I was going to say consensus, but understanding yeah, of some of, kind of agreement. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the other, so, so I'll plan on doing that. The other, but then there's also, um, I talk about cost of living as a as a as a separate topic, but it it, mm -hmm. it, it really is intertwined. So, um, in their eyes, at least in terms of they always, the the finance committee always talk about total compensation to mm -hmm. employees. Um, so I'll just group that in there. I mean, there's a disagreement. At least last year, there was a disagreement as to the appropriate way to calculate that and the role of that. Um, it's really a, a partial disagreement on, uh, I guess, the validity or applicability of, of certain data. Um, but 
Um, yeah, so I think we just need to start that discussion. Yeah. So yeah. I don't yeah. want to belabor the point. Well, yeah, it, right if, it, and if it moves quickly, it might be applicable for next spring, but the likelihood is it will be a, a year following that. Oh, goodness, don't say that. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just looking yeah. at the timetable and everything else that will have to be discussed come spring. This would have to be ironed out by January, right? Yeah. Okay. And then looking forward at, at the rest of the budget, um, I'd like to, to try to get the, the what I call the town budgets a little bit earlier than normal. Um, and then education budgets, we don't have much, we don't have much control over that. Last year was unique in the, in the sense that the, we had a new governor and the legislature, whenever there's a new administration, there's more leeway in terms of when they, you know, file their initial budget. Which leads to the first cherry sheet that comes out into uh, a snapshot. I always see initial snapshot of what locally it's going to look like, which the schools base their budgets on. So, um, yeah. So it, it, usually, the the school budget is going to be the last thing discussed because that's going to be the last thing that comes in. Yeah. And also, yeah. Most of the, yeah. And also oh. the most money. So. Yeah. yeah. All right. Because okay to comment. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. I, I guess going backwards um, from the schools, we can get some idea there. They put out their budget December, first meeting in December. The school committee gets the budget. We can ask for it at the same time. Um, it will not be the budget they voted on. Uh, it may not be their final budget, but it's what they're thinking. So if we want more information, we can get that as early as December uh, from the school committee. So maybe that's one thing to put on the, the list in terms of getting things earlier. Um, the uh, I, I think it's really critical to have that conversation with the finance committee. Um, but I, I, I know it's just, I feel like it's gonna come down to um, kind of a, a lot of poor choices. You know, there's a reason why we use comparisons to other towns. Because that's what, I mean, if you're a trained fill-in-the-blank municipal employee with that particular skill set, um, you, you look around and what are different towns offering, and that's what you've got to choose from. So that kind of, uh, in some ways, is a natural thing to do. I'm not saying it's problem-free. Um, but I, I do know, I think we've got a group of people whose expectations are not going to be met no matter what. Um, they're, they're, they're not, there's not going to be a great solution to this problem, because if there was an easy, great solution, we'd have found it already. Um, and then going back to the capital planning thing, what I feel like we maybe should start asking our departments to do is, and maybe we already do this, maybe I'm just not aware of it. Um, maybe they, we should be asking them for five-year plans. Like, tell us what you think you might need in the next five years. So we can start thinking about that and thinking about ways to get that funded. And we now have an awesome assistant town administrator for community development who may be able to look at those things. And if there are things we're looking at in you know two or three years down the road, that's easier to write a grant for, right? Something where, where you might uh, kind of have some needs that you've at least identified. Um, so it seems like, like this, the common theme for at least two of these is, is doing as much as you can ahead of time, getting the pre-planning in place. Uh, I don't know how to do that with the personnel committee. Having been on it for, so I don't remember how many years now. Um, it's not, there's not a lot of great options. And so maybe finding out a little bit more about the expectations of the folks on the finance committee um, in terms of what, what do they really want? I think they really want, I don't know, maybe that's the discussion that we should have. What do you really, really want? And um, and how do we how do we do it and take care of all the things we know are really important, like keeping good people and um, making sure people are compensated fairly. 
and um yeah anyway that's i guess that's enough of a rant for me i will say the, the capital improvement like we do get have had multi-year projections from most departments so oh, okay we, we, we do we do have some ideas but things come up and other things break down and other needs arise yeah that, oh okay that so so we're already doing that at least but for you know, some we, like we, no we have a you know strong idea uh, when the fire department's going to need what they need and when the police right. department's going to need need um let's say highway and police i think or the highway and police um uh, highway is the, the toughest one because things sometimes last longer than they expect and sometimes don't last quite as long as would be expected so the years yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, sometimes things can get pushed out but it, and sometimes they can't right but this doesn't have to be for the you know the you know the million dollar fire truck or whatever um like the the rec commission the rec committee should tell us what they need in the next five years or what they think they might need in the next five years you know kind of kind of everybody uh and it doesn't have to be the biggest of ticket items um i mean grants are come in all sizes right and we should probably be spending at least a little time going for little grants although you know that's Sort of not. That's not under my particular control or anything. But that's. Uh... Oh yeah, I think the recreation in particular, rec commission in particular, gets down to the rec commission meets and someone says, "Wouldn't it be nice if we had instead of in <laughs> a longer term schedule of replacement? You know, would, wouldn't batting cages be nice?" <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rather, rather than okay, in four years we're going to plan to build batting cages. Yeah. So we can encourage them to move from. Wouldn't it be nice to? We can encourage them, but I like think a lot of it is just yeah. the inspiration of a member saying, uh, "You know, I, I was in another town you know, on vacation and saw this town had this, and wouldn't it be great if we had that?" Yeah. Which you can't pre-plan. You can make a wish list, though. You don't know what you're wishing for. You can't even make that. Sorry, well, if, I think, if somebody says, "Wouldn't it be nice?" You're right. Well, yeah, now. but but it might. They may not. It may not be for two years until someone. You, know, you I just say it's yeah. very hard for things like that to plan out. But in, in the future, but anything as, that's as hard. As to a new police vehicle. Okay, right. we know we're going to need that in two yeah. years. Right, but people can learn, and yeah. it's hard to do, but people can learn. And so if you ask them to do it, I mean, it's how you learn how to do things, right? You practice trying. Yeah. So that'll, um, then whether it happens by writing it down or by uh, some other means, then then fine. But I think we will we'll benefit if, if all the departments are thinking, um, are thinking down the road. And yeah. get money for okay. that. So I think thinking of how we can get money for this. To move the line. Oh, I wanted to ask. Can oh, I sure. no, yeah, sure. question? Absolutely. Joyce, can uh, this having past year having been my first year of looking at the finance stuff, um, how how does the personnel committee gather that data about what's happening around us? Do you call up individual towns, or is there a state database, oh. or what happens? Oh, <laughs> well, look at our administrative mm -hmm. assistant. She doesn't realize it, but uh, the uh, uh, administrative assistant has done a lot of that the legwork, so to speak, you know, the phone calls and calling towns and asking. So um, there's not the state database where it's entered. It's like individual. No, no that would be okay. easy. Yeah. That, would that, be, yeah. that would be so sensible. There is something that the, the FERCOG usually puts together a, a, a list of like jobs and salaries for Franklin County. But yeah. many of the towns are just not really very comparable to us. And there's all the problems with comparisons are yeah. are are there with that particular document as well. Okay. There, there, Thank you. There are lots of hypothetical state databases that would be nice if they existed, but nice, don't. Right? Yes. Uh, all right. Thank you. Uh, okay. So I think we want to try to urge department heads to get back to us, at least with potential CPA projects earlier. 
and budgets, and maybe we will the budget deadlines have been what January 15th. We've spent some time in January, yeah. Um in practical terms, is there any difference between December 15th and January 1st with the holidays? Um not I don't I do not for not for me when I I'm just saying for, for you know, in practical terms, if we were to say we want to move it up from January 15th. Yeah. Is there any practical difference between saying December 15th and January 1st? I think I would want to be. I think December, you got to pick the earlier date, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. I, yeah. Get it in so people can be thinking about it and digesting it. I yeah. see Keith, Keith, would you have a problem with the December 15th? All right. Okay. So that probably could probably do this now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You need a vote or is this an administrative? Yeah, I just wanted that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and if we wanted to communicate to all of the departments that they start thinking ahead, is that in the same package or in the same what Joyce was suggesting? Like think of ahead in a five year plan or oh, so, so we yeah. in the in the memo that, that we send out, it's mm -hmm. usually asking them to project 10 years ahead. Oh wow. Okay. Um, and, and oh Joyce, you're asking for so little. <laughs> um, no, I know. There's department there are Departments that do better than others. Yeah, okay. Right, yeah. Checking their needs. Got it. Okay. Like I said, highway does a good job, and police do a good job. Um, and there's others that are more last minute. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So. Okay. Is there anything we need to vote on? <clears throat> Moving on, discussing the idea of entering into public works mutual aid agreement with surrounding towns. We have a specific proposal on this, or this is a general discussion. So, uh, I'll mention what what this stems from, and then um, it, it should, I think it's just going to be a general discussion. Uh, when when they had the, um, I don't remember when it was when when the when they had the flooding in Conway, um, uh, they requested mutual aid from Waitley, um, and I think we sent. The excavator and front loader, right? Yes. yes. So I think it was Keith and, and we, Keith and somebody else went with you. Dougie. Keith yeah. and Dougie went out and provided them aid during the, you know, during the time that they needed it. Um, and unbeknownst to me, I just didn't know that there was a there was a state law um, that talked about public works mutual uh, mutual aid agreements. Um, and it sort of lays out uh, the terms of, of how that happens. So sort of the, I was thinking more of the, the liability of it, the sort of the legalities of it, um, and sort of who pays costs and how does that all play out if something is damaged, all those types of things that nobody really wants to think about in right. terms of times of emergency. Um, people just, as they should, in my opinion, just respond well, to you know, your, neighbors, your neighbors yeah. when they need it with the, Understanding that your neighbors are going to hopefully help you when you need it, right? Um, so, um, so there's there's this, this law chapter forty forty uh, chapter forty four K, um, and it talks about those you know the different uh, the legalities of, of that relationship and, and how it happens, and um, there's the sending party obviously, and a requesting party, the requesting party is the one requesting the services, the sending party is the one who's sending the services. Um, typically speaking, the sending party covers its own costs, pays its own employees, um, and uh, should typically document costs, um, and those types of things. Um, and then the law says the sending party and requesting party, they sort of waive claims against each other, um, in terms of if something were to happen. Uh, but the law does say the requesting party needs to indemnify and hold harmless the sending party for any third party claims. So, so in this instance, Conway was the requesting party, Waitley was the sending party. So if there were any third party claims that happened against the town of Waitley, Conway would be obligated to 
indemnify and then both completely harmless. Um, and then the other part of the law says that the requesting party is obligated to apply for reimbursement if and when there's emergency aid that becomes available and the cost reimbursed to the sending party. Um, so this was a, a learning experience for me. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess it, it seems sufficient. I mean, the law does mention that uh, this is sort of the default. This is, this is the default arrangement under the law. And if parties wanted to have uh, other agreements to, to change the terms of that relationship, they could. Um, but I don't know that there's been any there's been any issues with how it's operated, right, Keith? In your mind? Yeah, I mean, I can elaborate a little bit. Just, you know, in what Brian is talking about, Mass Highway Association about three years ago implemented the mutual aid program. And it's statewide, and each county has a county mutual aid coordinator called the CMAC. And when a town needs something, they're supposed to contact the, that coordinator. Well, many towns, when it looks say this much fire, fire departments, ambulances, things like that, mutual aid's been present for forever. But when it comes to highway stuff, DPWs, it's more recently, and there's still, it's still a learning curve. There's not a lot of time, a lot of times the town doesn't think quick enough to say, geez, I need help in our public works department and request it. A lot of times it's, there's a delay in doing it. Um, so it's a, there's a learning curve. A lot of the towns, in this case, like Conway, they could have just requested through the mutual aid program. And so it's it's already pretty well set, but it still needs to have a little bit more um, of the kinks ironed out to make it work better. Um, but I'll keep working with Brian to to let you know to get to make sure that we, you know we're capable of uh, requesting it when we need it, and also like in this case, we supplied. Conway's request when they contacted us. So, um, and I've already talked to Conway in regards to um, submitting the paper for reimbursement. So that hasn't happened yet, but it's it's in the works. Would it be an issue that some of our surrounding towns are not in Brentham County? Therefore, we... you could again you contact. In the case of my scenario, I would contact the Franklin coordinator yeah and if what i needed was only available in Hatfield. springfield it's it okay. don't matter it, it okay. doesn't have to be just frank okay that's it's, we say it's, it's a, a state, state coordinator. That, program yeah that, that. And this is and this one actually has it's actually been implemented many times already for, for winter operations for snow removal when one part of the state gets hit heavy They'll pull resources from outside of that area. Okay, but, so that being involved, that would mean we would not need specific bilateral agreements with every. Correct. Every that's what, and that's what I'll work with Brian on right. uh, that aspect of it. Yeah, I think, I think we just wanted to sort of have this discussion because it. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it seems like this may be the way that the weather is going to trend for who knows how long will we get these significant, you know, rain events over a period of 24, 36 hours and in localized areas where, you know, this it may very well be to happen again, um, or maybe we'll be asking for it out, but it's, you, you don't know what bridge or what dam is going to give out. Right. So we just sort of wanted to have that discussion that there's this framework in place as to the relationships between all the okay. and how that works um but it, it it the default relationship right now under the statute is that is that Waitley would pay those costs you know Waitley would pay those costs subject to reimbursement if if you know aid was to become available if we wanted to change that 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 relationship, then we would have to, I think, enter into a, a, a different agreement if we were to want to see payment under different terms or something like that. But I, and it comes back to the it comes back to the you, 
what got me thinking about this mm -hmm. was your comments about the ambulance and yeah. the ambulance going, uh, the scams ambulance going out of the mm -hmm. jurisdiction a lot and cost, but I don't, it, it's very few and far between at this point, I believe. So, um, but I just wanted to. Yeah, because th th this will come up essentially only in emergency situations. The mutual aid and the fire side yeah. of things, that, I mean, that's happening daily. Right. Yeah. Give and take here. And, and an ambulance too has happened. Right. Pretty that's much. what I'm saying. It's it's very common. Right. But in the aspect of the highway departments, DPW is, is relatively a new concept of trying to better use resources statewide. And it's, there's a learning curve on for each town to and in general, fire and ambulance are small scale events. They're in fact, you know, one house, one family. Correct. As opposed to Correct. The when you have public works would be sweat, it's, road, it's, roads or bridges or something getting washed out. Correct. And affecting a large number of people. Okay. Uh, next. This got in chapter 90 project request facing a long plain road range work on Egypt Road. Yep, I gave Brian the uh, applicant a form for the project request. Um, it is to do some paving on Long Plain Road from the Hatfield Town Line northerly for about a mile. In some, not not the entire thing, but where the worst areas are that need to be reshaped and leveled up, and then also at the intersection of Egypt Road. There's been an ongoing drainage issue in the winter time, especially when the ground is frozen, where it turns into a pond there at that intersection. So we're going to attempt to, or not attempt, we're going to put in drainage to that way to alleviate that problem in the winter. Okay, so this letters. Right. Uh, I think we've got the paperwork. We're signing that now. Um, I have a quick question about the formatting of the agenda. Is there a difference between the italicized items and the non italicized, or is that just you hit control I? Those were, well, I did hit control I. <laughs> uh, those were the two revised items. Oh, gosh. This is the revised agenda. Yeah. Is it only this one here? Yeah, I think so. Uh, do we need, do we need to a vote to approve this or simply? I think we could have a vote. Yeah. I move that we approve the request for paving on Long Plain Road and Drainage Road on Egypt Road. Second, all in favor. Yeah. Uh, to discuss and vote to appoint election workers for calendar 2024, we have a list of 15 proposed election workers from our town clerk. Any further comments? Well, beyond? Is the same workers that have worked with this town for a while now, so they're all very familiar with the process and are willing to help out right here. I will move we approve the list as submitted by the town clerk. A second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. I appreciate their service every time I go to vote. Yes. <laughs> uh, to best invoke whether to appoint Jessica Murphy to the position of assistant town clerk. Hmm. Any comments? <laughs> oh, I got a lot of comments. No, just like... <laughs> hmm. Sounds good. We have a letter. Yeah, um, can you give us a letter. What? Outlining her hours and. Yeah. Uh, position five hours a week at a rate of $25 an hour. That would allow for additional hours. The most help that I'll need is next year because we have four elections. Okay. So that's not really need help. So um, I have the five hours weekly, but that allows for a bank of additional hours that can be used during election time when I may need more than five hours. That makes sense. Okay. okay. I'll move we. Approve Jessica Murphy to the position of assistant town clerk. Second. In favor? Aye. Aye. So that's a letter from the town clerk regarding hunting and fishing licenses. So tell us what's in your letter. So, well, I don't have the letter in front of me, but I okay. think basically um, 
Are you all there? Uh, I'm just requesting that we reinstate the service for our residents. It is something that we used to offer. However, when the state changed over its system, there was a lot of bugs and kings to work out, and a lot of town clerks dropped the service. Hmm. However, uh, I pulled most of the town clerks in the state, and a lot of them, about I would say about half still offer the service have said that they dropped it because of all the bugs that were happening when they first started it and they just never revisited it. Um, I talked with the state, the, he tells me that it's all worked out and it's a much easier process when, than when they first implemented the online database. And so I would like to offer that for residents now, <clears throat> again. I think that makes sense. Yeah. It would just re it would um I would request a revolving fund that would have to be obviously approved at a special town meeting of a thousand dollars just because what happens is the resident comes and pays me at the end of the month the state takes all of the fees out of the account so if there's like a lapse between when I turn over the money versus when the state takes it out, there's still a cushion there. Mm -hmm. Okay. I move the V. Joyce, any comment? Sorry. Sorry. No. Okay. I move that we uh, now begin again to reissue hunting and fishing licenses. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you. So, so in terms of the timing. Yeah. In order for obviously the yeah. that the money the seed money for the revolving account to be able to get special time yeah making the list right <laughs> uh, yeah updates live on Joyce anything oh um we just got a hundred thousand dollar grant for the uh for um yeah. I want to say technical literacy. That's not it. Um, digital uh, literacy. Digital literacy. That's what it was. Digital literacy. Um, thank you to our uh, our senior center director who has been really awesome about applying for grants. And you, we all, of course, are awesome for signing all those letters to support them. But uh, uh, that was uh, that was a nice thing in the in basket today. So I think uh, kudos. Uh, kudos to Jennifer, and uh, and uh, it's going to be money well spent. Cool. Um, Water Department, they are having a hearing, a public hearing tomorrow to discuss updated rates. I have the information from Wayne. Honestly, you know, when you look at a spreadsheet that somebody else has laid out and it makes sense to them, I need to talk to Wayne about it so I understand what the spreadsheet means. Um, and I will be able to attend a hearing briefly for about a half an hour tomorrow. Looking forward to hearing what people have to say. Okay. And I met with the fire chief and just went over what he's, he's been there oh, about two months in the position now, working on just trying to spruce up the the building fire department a little bit physically, but also just to help with morale, retention, and recruitment issues. And the appearance of the building plays into that. Mm -hmm. um, and in general, things seem good on that front, but he's working hard and trying to address things that he told us he was going to address. Uh, and administrator updates. Oh, can I ask a quick question in there? Oh, sir. Um, the water hearing, is that something that FCAT is going to be recording or is going to be recorded for? Because um, I will probably not be able to make that. I am not certain. Um, it's it's going to be Zoom, so it will be recorded. And okay. FCAT should be here as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I got okay. here earlier. He was undecided at that point an hour oh, okay. ago whether he was going to be there or not. Right. If it's just a Zoom recording, that's fine too. That goes up on FCAT's site. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. You can watch it okay. I'll make that. And you're, and you're going to make sure that they explain it real good. 
so that yeah. I understand it from watching the video. Okay, thank you. I'm just interrupted. In terms of, at the last meeting, there was a discussion about uh, flooding alongside Christian Lane. Mm -hmm. um, Wayne has, uh, Wayne reached out to uh, Massboro Water Association and they are going to be loaning us their uh, sewer drain camera. Um, oh. Like the, cool. um, I think they're gonna bring it out next week, I think. So we'll try to take a look through that pipe to see what's there and what's not there um, and get a sense of, of the condition of those to the extent that, that we can. Um, we also still need to try to do a little bit of the research into our records to see what ownership may be. Um, but so hopefully we'll have sounds like those are going to be pretty old records. To, yeah. yeah. Um, so hopefully we'll have better information at the next meeting um, and hopefully have closer to some resolution or idea of how to resolve the issue, which has been around for a while, I understand. Um, the weatherization work at the elementary school has been completed. Um, we still need to do a final walkthrough um, to see their work, but they said they did it, so it must be done, right? Uh, so we're going to do a walkthrough of that uh, fairly soon. That was the additional insulation and air sailing, and um, that was uh, scheduled to be there uh, to take place at the school. Um, in terms of the school, at some point over well, the, I was told it was last Thursday, I believe, um, when one of the thunderstorms rolled through, two of the uh, standing pine trees between the building and the driveway were struck by lightning. Um, so um, Keith has uh, taken a look at them as a tree warden, and I believe the school also had some, uh, a different company look at them. Uh, he doesn't feel that they're any, they're not in immediate danger of falling, but the trees are are going to have a very short lifespan, likely um, after getting zapped. So um, uh, Keith is looking into whether the, the the town with rental of some equipment can take the can take those trees down safely. Um, so that's uh, just something happening at the during that event. Also, um, they're going to be looking at the generator that's out back. Um, to make sure that nothing happened, nothing serious happened with that. Apparently, it did not kick on, um, so we don't know if those two events were related or not. So they're going to get the generator with that as well um, to see what's going on there. Um, Are they thinking about replacing those pine trees at some point when they're taken down? Um, I have not uh, heard of any discussions around that. I'm asking partially because I used to work for the firm that built that school and keeping existing trees intact was a really big yeah. part of their plan. And also because a citizen had contacted me about tree removal and replacement. So it would yep. be interesting to know. Yeah, yeah, we can, have, we can ask those questions for sure. Thanks. Um, August 16th, there is a stakeholder meeting and invitations were sent out to um, all property owners within the Anchor 35 study area. Mm -hmm. um, and we will have a discussion with the property owners that show up as to um, you know, what their ideas are for their properties within that area. And really um, the thoughts that uh, the consultant has in terms of that area. Um, and really just have, hopefully have a conversation about you know, what, what folks are planning. Will that be on Zoom? I'll be away. Um, Yes, I believe it's scheduled to be here. So I believe it. That's not so okay. Yeah. That's August 16th. Um, and I wanted to talk about the webinar that I attended yesterday. I was going to say I wanted to talk briefly, but I don't know how brief I'll be. <laughs> um, about the uh, the cannabis, the, the revisions to the cannabis control law and the, the draft regulations that were issued by the CCC. Um, it was a webinar put on by Mass Municipal Association, and the the, the presenter was was from KP Law, an attorney from KP Law. Uh, and there were three things that were highlighted in the webinar, um, and they were uh, provisions of really the draft regulations 
in, in relation to host community agreements, um, community impact fees, and what, what they call social equity um, guidelines, I guess, or they're really requirements. Um, so prior to the prior to the legislate the, the recent legislation, the, the CCC its role was not clear in terms of its authority over host community agreements. With the new legislation, it's very clear that the Cannabis Control Commission uh, can review, regulate, enforce, and approve HCAs, HCAs meaning host community agreements. So now they have regulatory authority over the host community agreements. Um, and along with that, they have um, you have more specific requirements as to what can and can't be included in host community agreements. Um, as it relates to um, host community agreements, um, they really tightened up um, the regulations around the community impact fees. Um, they are they will not allow. So our community impact our community our post community agreements include community impact fees. It's three percent of gross profit. That's not going to be allowed anymore. Um, the, the the draft these are draft regulations. I'm assuming that they're going to even be adopted or not. But this is what the draft regulations said. And it says you can't um, you can't require any in kind contributions or charitable contributions, um, which arguably are included in our HCA as well. Um, at least for at least for uh, one component of them. Um, so that's sort of what the host community agreement can and can't involve. So in, in terms of the idea that communities were going to receive a, a sizable amount of revenue for community impact fees, it, I, I think that's how we um, do it. There's the regulations talk about. And, and the original legislation was similar to this, that the community impact fees need to be reasonably related to the impacts of the cannabis establishment. So it, it, it's, it really limits the scope of what are allowable, what you could spend your impact fee on. Um, they also increase the uh, administrative, I'll call it the administrative burden on how a municipality would be reimbursed or, or collect the, that community impact fee. They're gonna require uh, itemized invoices with specific descriptions and costs of, of, of what the municipality is claiming to be an impact or in a cost that's attributable to the facility. Not the municipalities typically don't, we don't typically run, you know, we, we don't typically itemize what we spend our hour on or it, you know it, it we're not a consultant or, or a law firm where you know we would write down you know 15 minute call with whoever you know cannabis establishment it's not typically how we operate um and it, it's entirely not clear whether even simple you know phone calls uh, or or interactions with, with the cannabis establishment would qualify for that because it needs to be something above and beyond the typical business of of what the, of, of the town essentially right if if emails and phone calls with businesses are something we typically do for any type of retailer then it's not something we could attribute to the impact of the cannabis establishment in in, in practice it, it it's likely going to be limited um so um, it, it, the administrative burden has definitely increased. Um, there are now, um, the CCC now has authority to fine municipalities um, if they are not in compliance um, with these regulations. Um, we can be fined, the municipalities can be fined up to $50,000 for non-compliance with the, the um, but essentially, the host, the host community agreement regulations. Um, and they cannot, municipalities can also be fined, and I'll talk about social equity guidelines in a minute, but they can also be fined for not having adopted the social equity provisions that will be required in these draft regulations. It, it's really be, it's really gone from, and this is, this is my opinion, it's gone from 
when this all first started, there was this really this carrot for municipalities. It went from the carrot to the stick really quick, in my opinion. There was this carrot for municipalities. Oh, you can have all this revenue, community impact fee, tax money. You're going to get all this money, you know, so everybody open up and allow these businesses to operate. And now it's turned quickly to really the stick approach where all oh, municipalities, you need to do this, 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 and this, this, and this, and this, or we're going to find you. So it's really flipped in my mind. Well, um, okay. what kind of obligations are there under the agreements that if we were not to follow through, we could be fined for? Um, in terms of what could we be fined for? Right. What what what, are, what do we have to do with if we don't? We can get fined. Um, if we have a host community agreement, this is what this will bring. If we have a host community agreement that is out of compliance with the CCC regulations, any component of the CCC regulations, we could, in theory, according to the draft regulations, we could be fine. If we have not adopted the social equity guidelines, the social social equity requirements, we could also be fine. That's a different fine. We would have to that the the, the limits of that fine are. Um, it cannot exceed the total amount of CIF community impact fees that you collected in the previous year. For us, there would have been zero, but um, <laughs> in, in for many people, it, it may be zero, um, depending on whether they have the administrative staff to, to handle that. Would, would it be a violation if we do not revise or rewrite the agreement? Say, oh, I know our existing agreements have a charitable contribution element. Yeah. If we do not collect that contribution or bill it or anything, do we still have to rewrite the agreement or is, does it essentially become void? So the legislation allows the, the uh, cannabis, uh, cannabis Control Commission mm -hmm. to retroactively review post community credits. Um, and if they were to it, it, it's likely that they're going to review they would likely review them. Um, I'm not saying this that they're likely going to review them upon license renewal is is what we anticipate. Um, if it's out of compliance they will they will issue a notice of non-compliance to the municipality and say your host community agreement doesn't apply or, or doesn't comply, and these are the provisions that that we find that don't comply, and um, you need to rewrite so your we agreement. Just rewrite it. Um, and at that point, according to the draft regulations, the, the town has two options. One, they can go ahead and rewrite it, those community agreement to um, to comply, or it could um, enter into what's called a HC, what the CCC calls an HCA waiver. And that is a waiver from the municipality saying we don't we're not going to require a host community agreement. We're fine with that. We're fine with not having one. And the business can still operate. Once you waive, though, my understanding is that you waive it for as long as the business operates, and it can only be, for lack of a better term, unwaived um, with permission of the, the cannabis control commission. Or um the parties can agree, or, or likely the municipality would say, do we want to discontinue our relationship with the uh, cannabis establishment? What that means at this point is unclear. Mm -hmm. um, what the regulations say is that is that the, well, the law says there needs to be a host community agreement for the for the establishment to operate within your time. Cool. So the, the triple C can can provide equitable relief to the cannabis establishment. And one of the things that are listed is that it says that um, this the triple C can extend the expiration date of a license. Uh, that could mean to me that the possibility exists that they're going to extend the, the license date. So the need to have a host community agreement, but maybe you don't need a new one at that. It, it seems to, it's unclear what it means. Uh, I'm sort of thinking worst case scenario is a sort of, 
they just allow the establishment to continue to operate in the municipality without public security. Uh, I think that's, I think a lot of that's problematic. And it, it, it's going to be, it, all of this is going to be a case of first impression for the courts. It, it's really not well flushed, uh, flushed out. Um, but, uh, so at some point, I would imagine that we might hear from the Cannabis Control Commission and they're going to say, well, we don't, you know, we're going to, we reviewed your HCA and we think it's, we, we think it's, it's not going to happen. And then we would have to, you know, figure out how to proceed from there. Uh, I just wanted to touch on uh, the, the social equity piece of it because it was part of the legislation and, and it, it's a little bit different. It, so the regulations require host communities to adopt social equity. Um, they're, they're really requirements. It's really social equity mandates. Um, so if you want to be a host community, you have to adopt these social equity things. Um, and those are, um, we have to have, uh, we have to put our local approval process on the website. We have to post the local approval process on the website and in a conspicuous location in town. Uh, we have to upload and make available all the approval documents that are needed for um, all local approvals in town. Um, we have to identify key individuals in the approval process with like their name, business email, business phone, business address, um, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, we have to adopt scoring criteria in a standard evaluation form when we evaluate post community agreements. I mean, I think they're thinking that this is in, in larger towns and cities, this, this at one point was a competitive process, and, uh, not the small town who gets one at a time and treats everybody the same. And there's not there's not a limitation on the number of post community agreements. Um, and then the, the select board needs to have a narrative explaining the approval or denial of the, of the host community agreement. Uh, and that's really just a summary of, of what's required. Uh, host communities to develop a plan to promote and encourage full participation um, of social equity businesses. We need to adopt and uh, we need to apply and include goals, programs, and measurements that we will utilize to promote and encourage equity participation. You have to publish data um, of our total applicant pool and identify social equity uh, program participants. Um, so we have to take those affirmative steps to um, essentially implement a social equity program if we want to remain, if we want to be a host community uh, for cannabis establishments, is my understanding of how the draft rate works. Um, the regulations say that. Uh, municipalities must adopt local rules and bylaws uh, to comply with the requirements on or before May 1st of 2024. Um, mm -hmm. After May 1st of 2025, municipality and post communities um, who have not adopted uh, social equity, the social equity requirements are subject to fines that I talked about earlier, up to one year. The, prior, the previous year's total community impact fees that have been collected. Which in um, our case would be zero. Which in our case would be zero. Um, Why is this feeling like such a bad deal for towns and municipalities? <clears throat> and who makes money in this scenario? I mean, who's making money that it behooves the state to set it up like this? This just seems as backward to me, if you're part of the same. I think you only have to bribe certain people on certain committees in the legislature to get this sort of thing. Like, I'm stunned that the town needs to promote equity participation in a private business. Doesn't the private business need to promote their equity participation? I would love the town to have regulations about mm -hmm. equity participation in all businesses, but why do we need to put it in place for cannabis? It's absurd. I think yeah, it's, it, 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 it's yeah. not aimed at us. It's aimed at bigger cities yeah, that have competing people looking to open. 
and some of them are traditionally disenfranchised. Yeah. My, my so you would have to prove why you're giving it to one company right. over another company. That's what I would think. Yeah, okay. All right. That that makes a little more sense, but still somebody's at, making at money. Boston and Lowell and Lawrence. And somebody's Webster. making money and it's not us. And but it's, it's the private companies that are making the money. Yeah, but the private companies are making who's making money that it behooves the state to set it up this way. Oh, oh, yeah. You have to go to campaign finance. And go look at that's where that money is passing through to the government. And probably with a lot of white people, if you don't mind my saying so. <laughs> my, my experience. Yay, we're being recorded. <laughs> my, my experience when it's living through this yeah. process, yeah. Through, through the legalization process here, was that. There was, there were some high profile situations, very few, uh -huh. where the HCA process, you know, the process, and this was in the cities, mm -hmm. where it, it was not regulated. Mm -hmm. So it was unclear as to who was getting these valuable contracts and who wasn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, in, in the case that I'm thinking about, I believe it was Fall River. Um, I mean, there's ethics laws and there's, uh, and that's right, there's ethics laws and that's eventually going to happen. I believe somebody got indicted or something like that. But um, it, there was this, there was this outcry that the big bad municipalities were squeezing these poor little business people mm -hmm. for an extra, for an extra 10 grand, right? Mm -hmm. And, and that's sort of what the, that's what the narrative was that, this is totally my opinion. That's what the narrative was coming out, coming out of really one side of the mm -hmm. right, the lobby, the, the, the lobbyists, right? That was a narrative. The These big yeah. bad municipalities were coming, and they were trying to fleece everybody for every dime that they had to open up this mom and pop cannabis establishment. When in reality, the very few mom and pop yeah. cannabis establishments oh, yeah. exist, or oh, you know that. And the reason it didn't exist because it was so capital intensive yes, to open so one. much money to start it. Mm -hmm. um, Again, which is why people. I think the social <laughs> equity guidelines are misguided in the sense that I, from from my experience in watching folks try to open up and wait, wait, the biggest issue was capital. Mm -hmm. yeah. It wasn't. I, I mean, the select board throughout this whole process provided HCAs to any project that they thought were reasonable mm -hmm. that, 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 that didn't endanger public safety. And, you know, and I think eventually almost everybody who asked for one got one in terms of the host community agreement. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, you know, give it your best shot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But there was this narrative that the, it was the, the, the mean big municipalities we're squeezing these little these Wait, little business people for every dime that they had. And that's why they couldn't open, you know, because they had to pay, you know, three percent of whatever. Three percent of their trust. Right? Um and, and that narrative sort of carried forward, I think, and, and it's continued to carry forward. Um so I have another question. How are alcohol sales regulated? Like, do we have host community agreements nope. with Packies. No. Um, so, so this is another, you right. know, substance that could inebriate you. Know. We don't, and but it, it's 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 strange that it, that it wasn't it didn't roll out in the same way, right? Yeah. yeah. The select board as a licensing authority has a lot of control over the sale of alcohol in town. Okay. Right. If somebody, if we were to find somebody selling to an underage person, right, the select board could we could revoke their you license. could revoke their license, you could suspend their license yeah. after due process and a hearing, yeah. you could suspend their license, but that really does that framework doesn't exist in terms of cannabis. It's so um, weird. It's so weird. So we have this strange system with post community agreements, and now we have the the cannabis control commission, which is going to oversee. Everybody's host community agreements, and you have to provide these social equity guidelines, which 
quite honestly, I'm not sure the ones that they suggest, I'm not going to sure. I, well, you know my opinion. It's capital, right? I'm not sure it's going to make much of a difference, at least in Waitley. Mm -hmm. um, the select board has considered every single host to be um, I don't without. think there's a single one that we've turned down. There was one where the location was uh, a little controversial, but they found another location yep. and they got the host community agreement. Yeah. You're you're absolutely right about that, Brian. Um mm -hmm. so it's the system is broken and it's it's I think it's it's broken even more because now the 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 campus control commission is now going to try to come in and try to you know fix all the host community agreement problems and it, no offense but I don't think it's going to make it it's not going to make a difference because mm -hmm. the issue is capital mm -hmm. right um, it it was it was it was capital and knowledge essentially to how to run one of these facilities mm -hmm. um, the people the the companies that that are still trying to open in town had the knowledge and the capital to do so. Yeah. The ones that didn't make it lacked one of one or both of those. Um, it, and us putting stuff on our website and listing, um, you know, key individuals in the approval prompt, like, what are we doing? Um, it's just an administrative burden on, on, on the towns. Um, yeah, I, I, complicated. I, I think it's just another case of <clears throat> there being regulations issued which are aimed at larger communities and the small towns are collateral damage in the mm -hmm. process that yeah. we have to abide by rules that were really not set up and shouldn't For apply us. to us because yeah. they're just not relevant, but they apply to everybody. Yeah. And one of the lingering, uh, one of the lingering uncertainties is in relation to the community impact fee. What's an allowable impact fee? We've asked for definite. I've asked for definitions for years as to give us an example of what, what an allowable impact is, mm -hmm. so that we have certainty we can plan for. Let's let's just hypothetically let's say. Um, uh, drug abuse classes or drug awareness classes at in the high school. Then that in each each of the municipalities in, in the regional school district knew, you know, let's then we could hire somebody who's okay, we can pay the salary of a teacher, of a health teacher, you know, the, 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 but we have no idea. And, and with such uncertainty surrounding them, it's 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 really not worth it. And at this point, it's really not worth trying to collect it. So is there uh, any action that we need to take by any specific date, or are we just this processing has, all this information and waiting and seeing? This hasn't even been passed yet. Yeah. It's been, right. So it's thought that it will be, but there are draft regulations. So um, it, I'd like to try to draft up a letter uh, or a letter to the CCD with, with you know, our collective thoughts as to what we think about this, but and, and to the CCC or I, to legislators, uh, it would be the CCC. It, it's within the so the legislation is already passed. Okay. Um, so now this is the CCC, um, hmm. which quite honestly I've not been terribly impressed with when I've had interactions, and I don't mean to say that in a, in a, in a mean way. Mm -hmm. um, but it. I think this shows, and it's what I felt at, when I was in a, a workshop where, where the CCC, or we'll just leave it at the CCC, we're, we're presenting and having a discussion, and there was a total lack of, total. I perceived a total lack of awareness of how local governments operate. Um, it, it really was in relation to a lot of the stuff that they seem to have made worse. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to have joint letters from other municipalities? I, I suspect many. Just screaming in the wind. I just, I, it was a uh, very heavily attended webinar, I think. And you can see steam. Yeah. yeah. I think it wouldn't hurt to copy our legislators. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I, I ranted to Natalie and 
Oh, like it was good. Yeah. Time. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's punitive at this point. It yes, is, absolutely. Right. It is. You know, it's, it, you almost just, but, uh, hopefully that there's, hopefully that there's a financial incentive finally that we, we will see in this next fiscal year, said Ryan, in the past five fiscal years. But I mean, we, we think we're almost at the finish line with at least one of the retailers. And then the town would at least collect the 3% sales tax on it. Um, so there is a financial incentive, you know, to, I don't want to say stay in the game, but to, you know, to continue with, with, with what we need to do. But at this point, it's, maybe we can have some effect on and what we actually At this do. point, with nothing open, we have no idea what the size of that financial incentive is anything. Yeah. Right. And there's certainly a disincentive to try to mm -hmm. collect community impact fees if you have to document every yeah and every little bit and you don't even know if it's going to be approved once you document it. You could get fined for more than the amount of what you just collected. Right. Pending. Yeah. Um I'm a believer in a united front, so I wouldn't I would suggest if possible that we yeah. enhance with other communities. Uh, just because I think it's more powerful. Yeah, yeah. It's just, I I know that the MMA is all over this right now. Okay. Um, but I don't. I mean, at this point, it's it's sort of we not. I think municipalities sort of missed missed the ball in a sense in terms of the legislation, um, the original legislation that granted the. Yeah, control commission the authority that could be most immediate um, we missed the boat or they missed us both i think yeah i mean we had um did we have an opportunity to comment where we had missed it um i believe we had discussions about it i believe we may have actually sent something um to our legislators on it um But it was sort of, yeah, it was it was packaged differently in my view. Uh -huh. okay. it, it, they were trying to, it, it came across as we're, we're trying to clear up. It was, it was, we didn't know what authority the CCC had under the initial legislation. So that needed to be clarified. So it was clarified that they could review. So now it was clarified that they could mm -hmm. you know, review post community agreements. And this is what the CCC proposed to do with their authority. It, it, and it was and it was packaged with the social equity piece of it. Um, and I don't want to be skeptical, but sometimes experienced legislators can package things together for things to be passed that might not otherwise pass on their own. I'm not saying this would happen, but sometimes that's what happens. See any of the federal budget, right? <laughs> and, um, yeah. and things get passed to specifically to pass the small item on page 47. Right. These are called riders, right? right. Budget riders. Which no one noticed. Right. Um, so um, at some point, I think. Um, we'll have to take a look at our post community agreements um, and, and be prepared for you know what we what we might want to do with those. Um, and then we'll have to we'll have to look at what the what the social equity guidelines or, or requirements are. Um, it's not that they're it's not that they're difficult to do. It just takes time. It's just an administrative burden, um, but that is the get, longest get, get, administrator updates in the world. It's given that we're expecting no money to come back out of post community agreements and doing the minimum we need to do to not to get fined. <laughs> Probably what we should end up doing. Yeah, in, in the back of my mind, I've always wondered yeah. what the cannabis legislation does not prohibit 
a municipality from setting up a local licensing process. Um, it, it might be a way to go. I, I, I don't know that any town has done it. Um, but uh, somebody on the webinar had asked about, well, why couldn't we, why, why can't we regulate it similar to, um, yeah. similar to alcohol and, and set up a licensing fee structure similar to that? Um, and, and there wasn't really a reason why, why you couldn't, is yeah. nobody had well, uh, it. Well, the, the reason not to do would probably be the lawsuit you would have to defend when it got challenged. Yeah. <clears throat> Since it is not clearly spelled out that we're allowed to do it, yeah. If it was done, someone would say was even saying we weren't allowed to do it, but we weren't specifically authorized. Sure, that the CCC took that question from the webinar and went back and went, wait a minute, I have a, yeah. I have an amendment to this. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> we'll, yeah. we'll be local in charge of all regulation, not, not local regulation. Yeah, it would be interesting though if if the same is so. There is a, a, a role for municipalities to just bail out, but I, again, I don't know how that's going to, I don't know legally how that's going to play out. That would be an interesting situation where the town says, nope, we're done, and then the place continues to continue to operate, and the CCC extends the license to operate, and then we get quite messy. Wow, yeah. Or we just operate without this community agreement. Unfortunately, I mean, there's a lot of wait and see in this. And yeah. Do we still get the tax revenue even without a host community agreement because they're a business in town? Um, I believe we voted the sales tax, the additional sales tax revenue, so I believe that we should. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's not in the host community agreement. It's in the uh, the town accepting the uh, passing it at town meeting. Okay. No. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> the other webinar attend. No. <laughs> no. Joyce, any other comments? I've already had my rant. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I had mine, so we're good. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Yes, please. I mo move that we adjourn this fine fine meeting. Uh before I second, I would just note that our next meetings are on August 29th. And September twelfth. Oh, and the, just... can we the time for those meetings? August 29th will still be at four o'clock. Uh, where will you be? I'll be in that room. Then, <gasps> but I want to know. But I, I just want to know what time to show up. If you will, if we are no longer adjusting for time zones, then we will move back to six o'clock meetings. Okay, so from the 29th, it'll be six o'clock. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. That's, yeah. So no. Tuesday still work for everybody? What? Tuesday still work yep. for everybody? Yep. Okay. I right, motion to uh, second the motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye.